good evening to all of you uh, it's my immense pleasure to introduce dr dikki sofian uh, he is uh, icrs core uh, directoral uh, doctoral faculty for university of gaja meda uh, yogyakarta indonesia he is wonderful eminent scholar in the field of ird and uh, today's topic is religion and social capital amid the covid-19 pandemic in indonesia so today uh, we are going to hand over the session uh, to dr sofian and uh, if we have any question i request all of you to uh, write in the chat box or if we have the opportunity we can directly hand over to you and you can ask to dr sofian yes Okay, good evening all uh, from Yogyakarta, Indonesia. I'm very happy to be uh, with you all and thank you very much for the fine introduction, Dr. Chakraborty. Um, as uh, she was saying that I am a lecturer in the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies, which is an inter-religious, international, interdisciplinary uh, program on inter-religious studies. Uh, and the consortium comprises three universities based in Yogyakarta. The Gadjah Mada University, which is a non-confessional university, the Islamic University, and the Christian University. Uh, and all are based in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. And so we have a fine program uh, with a lot of research collaborations and enterprises with various different um, scholars from around the world. So I'm happy to uh, share with you some of my uh, thoughts and reflections on the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. Uh, I understand many of you are coming from India, and I'm sure that there are probably some similarities and uh, congruence with respect to how the dynamics, the social dynamics and the religious dynamics are unfolding uh, in both countries. Um, so I'll, I'd like to start with uh, my presentation, uh, if you allow me. Um, just give me one minute. Okay. Um, Okay, um, I'm trying to see my file here. Um, okay, here it is. Okay, can you see it all? Okay, so my talk will essentially focus on uh, religion and social capital and the nexus between uh, the two and how that uh, consequently affects the handling or mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm sure you would probably, as I mentioned, uh, see some of the similar dynamics in India and elsewhere, um, but there are some peculiar Arities and, and uh, unique features in the Indonesian society in which uh, one can observe. Uh, the picture you see is what we call a free uh, food storage, which is uh, within the uh, vicinity of my village uh, in the northern part of Yogyakarta. This is one of the manifestations, I guess, uh, of the social capital that we have. And so um, ever since uh, we uh, impose or the government imposed what's called the um, large scale social restrictions, uh, there have been a lot of these uh, free food storages um, popping up in various locations throughout uh, the country, especially in uh, you know, uh, very remote um, villages, districts, and so on. Um, what this essentially tells you is that there is a lot of um, resources in society um, that are, uh, you know, providing help and assistance to the marginalized communities 
or to the members of society who are most uh, affected by these uh, social restrictions. You know, in some countries they call it lockdown or quarantine um, or stay-at-home orders or what have you. Here, at the national level and at the provincial and district and majority level, we have what's called a large-scale social restriction. So despite that, there have been a lot of um, both civic organizations and religious organizations providing free food for, uh, you know, uh, the poorest of the poor and the most uh, marginalized communities, especially in the urban centers where many of the urban dwellers have lost their uh, employment. Uh, especially the wage uh, laborers who are, um, you know, um, depending their livelihood on uh, wage labor, on daily wage labor. <clears throat> so uh, the question, I guess, is, you know, why is social capital needed in time of crisis or in time of pandemic, or you might also say in, let's say, natural disasters or calamities? Uh, and then um, let's explore how the relationship is between religion and social capital. Are they mutually exclusive? Are they, um, you know, uh, reinforcing one another? Um, that can later on be uh, discussed. Um, but I guess one of the things about social capital uh, is this idea about trust and trustworthiness. You know, um, after undergoing this um, pandemic for at least three months now, I guess, uh, you know, across the world, um, you know, who do we trust more? Do we trust the media to tell us everything about the pandemic, about the COVID-19? Do we trust the government that is constantly giving out information and advisory to members of uh, society? What about civic groups or civil society organizations? Do we trust them in their delivery of services, in the charitable uh, endeavors, their donations? What about religious groups? Do you have confidence and faith in what they do? What about our local community leaders, our neighbors, our family members? And what's most important for religion, I guess, is, you know, do we have trust in God or gods or the supreme being, uh, you know, who uh, takes care of us, you know? And I mean, if God is uh, supposedly there and taking care of us, then why is God not doing anything to help human beings overcoming uh, this pandemic. So all of these, um, you know, questions are, uh, you know, um, coming into our minds and um, ideas about how uh, societies and, and groups and even individuals cope with the pandemic and how they could um, and should uh, respond to the pandemic. The um, picture you see here um, is a very um, typical picture of an entrance gate to a village, to a remote village, I must say, add. Uh, as you can see, uh, that it's a very constricted uh, and restricted um, village. And this has been propping up, you know, in, in a lot of the even remote villages throughout Yogyakarta and I'm guessing in other provinces and other parts of Indonesia. And, and, and thus, there is this sort of phenomenon, and I'm sure you're seeing this as well in some parts of India, um, where there is this deep distrust uh, of people coming from outside people coming from other villages, from other cities, from other provinces, especially those um, coming back from the urban areas or those coming back from the roads, red zone areas, you know, where um, the pandemic uh, has, has spread. 
uh, more than they have in other places, for instance. Uh, in this case, the capital city of Jakarta uh, is still now reeling with the uh, effects of the mass uh, infections and also East Java. So these two areas have been um, sort of um, on red alert uh, for many months now, you know, due to the rapid and widespread um, infection of the um, coronavirus. Um, but again, you are seeing this um, sort of distrust uh, in, uh, in strangers coming into your uh, villages, coming into your community. And this is something which is um, uh, quite new for some people, at least, you know, as a social scientist, I, I find this to be quite uh, alarming, right? And so it's not something that is, um, uh, that was asked by the government or advised by the government, but it seems like there is this fear of um, you know people coming from um, outside, um, and you can see this translated also at the national level, where uh, countries are closing the borders uh, from uh, foreigners, yeah, and even uh, foreign students coming into the country to study, yeah. So um, one of the things that we also have seen is this sort of normalization of inequality and injustices. Uh, I think now we are uh, all witnessing the unfolding drama of uh, racism uh, in America and how that has sort of spurned uh, a lot of uh, violence uh, in the streets um, of many urban centers and, um, and cities. Uh, we have also seen that there is an increasing um, uh, case of domestic abuse um, during uh, this pandemic. And in some cases, we have seen, uh, you know, uh, the uh, divulging of uh, infidelity in, in a number of um, households. Um, but it has also... Um, uh, made us realize, you know, through our online conferences and webinars that there is still this digital divide. You know, we are very lucky that we are able to um, participate in all these uh, marvelous webinars and international conferences and online meetings with people from, uh, you know, all over the world. I mean, I was just speaking with people from Geneva, um, and yesterday from India and, and other countries, yeah. And, and so it strikes me that, um, that this digital divide is something which has uh, been relatively ignored, you know, because we tend to think that uh, everyone has the same kind of access that we do and same kind of uh, technology that we have, you know, which is untrue. The other thing is this gap in communication and language and logic, you know. Um, in Indonesia, for instance, all of the um, language uh, used pertaining to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been uh, very foreign to many um, of uh, Indonesians, especially those uh, who are, you know, less educated and people who are living uh, in the margins of, um, uh, of life uh, in, in the country. And so many of the, uh, you know, communication and language and logic used uh, have not been understood well. Um, you know, particularly in Indonesia, we have been using a lot of foreign terminologies, you know, like stay at home, like quarantine, like lockdown, you know, uh, and all of these things. And, and, and these are language that are not necessarily understood well uh, by Indonesians uh, who are not uh, proficient in the English language, but yet even government officials and uh, religious authorities and uh, social, uh, you know, civic leaders are using uh, this language, which um, I think uh, may not necessarily be as effective and, um, uh, you know, um, 
good for for the understanding of the common people. Um, now, if you sort of um, juxtapose this idea about social capitalism and religion, you know, uh, one might be led to think that there is this uh, contradiction uh, between religion and social capital, because it seems like social capital may uh, pertain more um, toward uh, things that are mondial, you know, earthly, um, uh, you know, um, issues and, and connections and, um, you know, solidarity and, and so on, while religion um, relates more to uh, the so-called ultimate concern uh, and sort of trying to answer the bigger questions about the uh, you know, meaning of life, about, you know, what happens after life, and even this issue about sustainability, survivability of human beings as species, and where we are in this, uh, you know, magnificent um, uh, multiverse and so on, you know. Um, and I would argue that um, despite the sort of uh, seeming contradictions and uh, the um, sort of uh, difference in the logic between religion and social capitalism, there are a number of uh, similarities and uh, sort of reinforcing um, essence in, in both of them, you know. So as much as they might be uh, different in the... Um, in people's perception of religion and social capitalism, but then uh, many scholars have attributed uh, to the fact that religion is also a one uh, powerful resource within social capitalism that could be uh, used to mobilize resources uh, in which uh, volunteerism, uh, political participation and civic engagement could also be developed through uh, what's called religious uh, social capitalism. Um, in the case of Indonesia, you know, um, Indonesia has uh, two very large uh, Islamic organizations. One is called the Muhammadiyah, which was established uh, way before the uh, independence of the Republic of Indonesia. Um, and this is a modernist organization um, which sprang actually from uh, Saudi Arabia. So this is a spin-off of the uh, Wahhabi movement in so Saudi Arabia, but having a very socially uh, progressive uh, agenda. And so Muhammadiyah now uh, owns uh, a network of schools, clinics, orphanages, hospitals uh, across the country. In fact, uh, some of their schools and universities are um, much better than uh, some of the schools and universities uh, belonging to the state. The other is the Nahdlatul Ulama, which came a bit later on. Um, and the Nahdlatul Ulama essentially means the revival of the uh, Muslim scholars. And this is the more traditional uh, Islamic organization. In the island of Java alone, they have um, quite possibly around or more than 6,000 um, traditional Islamic boarding schools where uh, theologians and uh, seminarians uh, study the classical Islamic um, literature and uh, Islamic sciences. Um, but yet they are also very progressive in the politics, in the social agenda, and have been quite, uh, the two have been quite um, central in becoming uh, what we call uh, social anchors uh, in the Indonesian society. The uh, last organization is the Indonesian Council of Ulama, which is a relatively new uh, organization, which was established in 1975. But during the pandemic, um, it was also believed that they were very much on board with the government uh, agenda in terms of um, trying uh, to provide advice um, to 
uh, the members of society, notably the Muslim community, to essentially follow the um, advisor of the government uh, in the large scale social restrictions. Both Muhammadiyya and Nadatul Ulama have also contributed a lot in the uh, struggle and fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Muhammadiyya have spent uh, millions uh, in US dollars um, terms uh, for a lot of um, activities uh, on research and coming up with applications to help uh, members of the public and those in need of help and assistance and medical care. Uh, through the hospitals and clinics and, and doctors. The Nadatul Ulama have also uh, um, helped out in at least 28 provinces out of the 34 provinces and in 300 cities to provide assistance, social assistance to the most needy and those who have been affected by uh, the pandemic. The Indonesian Council of Ulama came up with uh, a fatwa in I think uh, the second week of uh, March, if not uh, mistaken, the 16th of March, to uh, give advisory to the Muslims to um, not conduct their congregational prayers in uh, the mosques and even um, you know, advise the Muslim community during Ramadan to prevent themselves from harm by not going to the mosque and even for not uh, praying uh, during uh, the Eid al-Fitri uh, celebration. So there's been a lot of um, sort of uh, cooperation uh, among these um, civic and religious organization in providing help and assistance to members of society uh, and also in support of the government policy on the social restrictions. So I guess in that sense, um, you know, there is uh, a civil lining, uh, lining uh, with respect to how um, religious organizations and civic uh, organizations um, could provide um, help and provide resources for members of society in the struggle and fight against the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in Indonesia. I will stop there, um, you know, um, just as an initial um, uh, sort of uh, presentation of my um, thoughts and reflections, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any um, questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for this initial talk. And, uh, I think the people aren't running, so I think uh, participants have some problem with the uh, following of your lecture with the PPT. So if you can do uh, for the next round of discussion, and if we have some question for uh, Dr. Sofian, uh, from my side, I really connect uh, in terms of uh, Indian scenario that happened uh, to us also. Thus, India is uh, very much secular to some extent, but yeah, in this COVID scenario, uh, all of the religious institutions were closed and till now it's closed actually. Though the government have been uh, uh, taken the decision to unlock and uh, the offices are been running, but till uh, the religious institutions are been closed. So that's very important decision because people usually gathered in, in the religious institutions for the praying, for their own mental satisfactions out of this anxiety, out of this you know pandemic situation. So it is wonderful uh, initiative taken up. And I really open the uh, floor to the audience, to the participants to have some question to Dr. Dickey, please. You yourself and you can ask the question. Yes, Carmel, uh, would you like to ask something or even PLE also? Yes. Unmute yourself. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this uh, illustrious uh, talk of yours. I have a little question or a, a rather a clarification. As when we uh, talk of religion, we also talk of spirituality. So, if uh, can we link spirituality with the, uh, I mean, social capitalism? 
as you see that there is some connection between religion and social capitalism thank you well thank you very much for the um, question and yes uh, i mean the whole idea of social capitalism is also connections because uh, social connections uh, is and does provide uh, strong resources for mobilization and strong support from uh, various groups in society. And so uh, it's easy to think of social capitalism in terms of uh, its utility, in terms of how people use social capitalism, uh, so, sorry, social capital to advance uh, their accomplishments in society by way of connection. And I think um, spirituality also speaks of connections, right? And connections to the supreme being, connections uh, to the universe, to the um, uh, you know uh, other species, and especially to uh, other human beings. So obviously, um, spirituality has a lot to do uh, with religion and social capitalism. And I think the key. Uh, thing here is the connections because ultimately uh, you know it's the resources within society and the resources within religion that could help get things going and this is one of the main arguments about social um, capital that social capital can accomplish um, quite a lot uh, social capital also um, imbues this uh, uh, shared norms and values uh, of let's say voluntarism and a social life and you know getting together in meetings and so on you know similarly religion does that right and, and spiritual movements also do the same thing and so uh, this idea about religious social capital uh, might also be quite useful in terms of our thinking uh, about the two categories. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, anyone else, Amal? Can you able to unmute yourself? No. Okay, so you can write your question in the chat box and I will ask you on behalf of you. That's perfect. Okay, so anyone else would like to ask something or Dick Sofian would like to uh, engage more with the examples in the field of how uh, the spirituality and uh, and actually spirituality is and religion sometime we um, make it you know in a very crucial terms of connectivity but sometime it's not so how we can actually uh, segregate two terms in an actual sense so can you please uh, elaborate a little bit more into this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, um, this is a very sort of classic um, debate yeah, between uh, religion and spirituality and, you know, which is uh, bigger and which is uh, more manifesting in society, you know, and how does it connect between the two. Uh, but I see uh, religion as sort of a manifestation of uh, you know spirituality uh, in uh, in this world and how it manifests itself in terms of um, organizations, in terms of groupings of people, in terms of how uh, it is codified in its uh, I guess religious laws and so on and so forth. While spirituality really um, talks about uh, you know, the transcendence talks about the things that are beyond the here and now, you know, that talks about the, uh, the elusive connections that we have uh, with the transcendental being and with uh, the things that are not immediately um, visible to our own eyes, for instance, or our own um, ability to uh, discern uh, like we discern uh, the natural beings or um, objects and so on. Um, so spirituality is much more fluid in that sense. And, um, you know, one might say that, for instance, 
uh, you know, the Japanese uh, society might not be religious, but they are highly spiritual, for instance, right? Um, and one might also say that one is uh, religious, but not so spiritual, you know, in, in that sense, because um, there are implications in how we use the term religion and spirituality. And I'm using the term religion here uh, in a very sort of liberal manner, uh, because that's how people understand religion to be. Yeah. But um, for those of you who are quite familiar with the, some of the Islamic organizations here in Indonesia, you would see that uh, some of our major Islamic organizations here are very progressive uh, and they have a very progressive social agenda as I mentioned you know the Muhammadiyah has uh, you know uh, pro most likely better uh, networks of schools clinics and hospitals compared to uh, you know the state alone you know and um, Yet, with so much uh, vast resources, um, you know, connections and assets and and human capital, yet you know they have uh, still sort of refrained themselves from sort of coming forward and um, to sort of um, uh, take over the state or hijack the state in any way. And so, I think there's something that is spiritual in the way they see the vision and mission uh, in Indonesia and how they see themselves positioned uh, in Indonesia. And uh, we have a question from Carmel. Uh, she is willing to ask, here what I understand is religion, the real motivation of the social capital religion creates the connection between all mm -hmm. and the next point she would like to share that and how now uh, is the best time to manifest to the spiritual side inside religions that can help the situation of nowadays mm -hmm. so, yeah like to say yeah thank you very much carmel and i think uh yes there is this sort of um rethinking about the role of religion in society and and this i think has been um you know drawing much of our attention lately uh, especially um i'm guessing since the 1980s or 90s where we saw um a great sort of uh, tendency toward the politicization of religion and I think uh, this has exposed religion to some major criticisms about uh, their orientation in uh, trying to hijack the state or trying to um, dominate the wealth of the nation or even dominate other um, religious minorities for instance and and this idea about um, you know trying to monopolize the absolute truth and i think this goes back to the idea uh, in which uh, alexis de tocqueville talks about um, you know social capital uh, in america in the late uh, 19th century uh, in his book on democracy in america because that is exactly what he saw that America in the 19th, uh, late 19th century um, had a lot of social capital uh, in them and they weren't so much concerned with the sort of uh, uh, you know political religious identity but they were more concerned with how they could build up America to become a uh, unified uh, federation yeah and hence we saw um, the uh, civil uh, war in America and so on. And so um, I agree with you that there is, uh, especially those from the more progressive uh, uh, leanings uh, of uh, politics and religion that they would much prefer to see more uh, sort of spiritual interconnections uh, uh, among people, among members of uh, society, because ultimately, you know, when uh, you think about it, you know, we are all 
the same. You know, we are all coming from the same uh, roots. Uh, and, you know, the argument is, uh, the argument now is to say that there is only one race and that's the human race. Right? But what we are seeing now unfolding in America, for instance, is this great polarization between the race and uh, ethnicity due to the institutional racism that we see. So when Robert D. Putnam wrote his book on bowling alone, I think he was quite correct in his assessment that uh, America is losing its, uh, you know, civic values and that people are becoming more and more, um, you know, alone in, in their togetherness, so to speak, right? So there is uh, a much less uh, civic engagement, much less political participation, voter turnout, and an increasing sort of um, cynicism toward uh, the state and distrust toward the state and distrust toward other members of society. And so I think if you are seeing some of these symptoms, then you are actually seeing, you know, uh, social disintegration in the making. And I think it's unfortunate uh, now that we are seeing the United States uh, seem to be heading that way. And I think this is where we as uh, intellectual scholars and civic leaders need to, um, you know, be aware of so that we don't make the mistake of uh, the other nations. Absolutely. Uh, and I, yes, yes, Professor Onirudho, please. Uh, Dr. Sofian, am I audible? Yes, yes, perfectly. Uh, yeah. uh, actually, I have a question. See, in our country, we find there's a problem with religion, like it's more of inclusion or exclusion. Mm. Who are you going to exclude from your group? You're in one group. Mm. But the, me, I coming from a family of, you know, multi-religious, you know, people. It's a group of uh, you know, my parents from all different religions uh, people have come from. So I never felt it at home. But then once I'm outside, it's a huge problem, like whom I should exclude and whom I should include. Mm. Now, is that a problem out there in Indonesia, in Jakarta? Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think um, you are referring to this idea about social polarization and, yeah. and, uh, and this uh, sort of increasing uh, trend toward, uh, you know, the politics of exclusion. And I think we are seeing a lot of this uh, in, in many countries, uh, even in, in Europe, in the US and in Southeast Asia. Uh, and I'm sure uh, the same thing is happening also to a certain extent in India. In Indonesia, we have also seen uh, this move toward social polarization. And one of the uh, things uh, that has created this trend uh, is also social media. Yeah, because the social media has also um, generated this, um, you know, uh, what's called the uh, echo chamber effect. Yeah, so people are uh, merely uh, reinforcing the values, norms, and thinking, uh, while thinking that that's the fact and that's the reality and that's the diversity out there. While in fact they're only listening to their own uh, echo chambers, and so um, I think you would see a lot of that in the social media today, and this was very much um, uh, manifest during the 2014 and 2019 presidential elections, and even until now, I would still argue that there is uh, still the remnant of the uh, polarization happening in 2014 and 2000. Uh, 19. The way I see it, the 2014 and 2019 presidential elections were like one of the most divisive moments uh, in, uh, you know, recent history, political history of Indonesia, especially post-reformasi. And so um, definitely um, we need to think uh, 
how we could overcome this polarization. I think that has also a lot to do with uh, the kind of language and logic and communication I mentioned earlier, which uh, was manifest also during this COVID-19 pandemic. I think uh, we are not speaking the right language. We are using a polarized uh, logic, uh, simplistic logic, that oftentimes dismisses uh, either the religious others or political others uh, or those who are different uh, from ourselves. Um, and we have seen this even within uh, extended families, you know, uh, we've even seen divorces uh, between husbands and wives because of their political, um, you know, uh, differences. Uh, which is quite ironic. We've never seen this before, you know. Um, and so there needs to be a rethinking in terms of um, how we look at this notion of the social in social media, because uh, as much as we might call it social media, but it seems like the spirit behind this is very much anti-social. So this COVID-19 a moment sir just a moment there is a question or observation from PLE uh, thank you so much PLE uh, government interest is uh, posing poising somehow what a uh, problem in religious upliftment and social capital thus creating more of a divide and uh, trans transgressions than engagement would you like to uh, elaborate more PLE so we can able to understand mm -hmm. yes Yes, uh, I wanted to say that uh, the divide between the extreme right government and uh, the left uh, leaning government uh, has created more of a transgression between people and uh, the social capitalism that has been uh, followed in other countries or as well as in our countries, then and engaging people of different faith. That is my, my observation. That's uh, what Professor Diki Sofijan was also uh, commenting just a moment ago. Yes, thank you very much. And I think, uh, again, you know, this is not just happening in India, you know. We are seeing this in Europe, we are seeing this in the United States, we are seeing this also in Indonesia. Uh, but again, um, I don't think it's, it's just simply uh, the, um, the contestation between right and left politics. Yeah? I think to a certain uh, extent, uh, I'm also sort of persuaded to think that this might also be uh, something that some of our politicians um, like to do or have intended, you know, because, you know, one of the um, sort of political uh, tactics and strategies to win uh, the elections is is to sort of chop down your uh, the overall constituents and really uh, go to the far right or left to really ensure that you have that strong um, uh, backing and, and political support that you needed and and I think that was the sort of tactic and strategy that Donald Trump uh, had used, you know, during the presidential elections in, in the US. But as you can see that although he had won the elections, uh, that he's not being very successful or he's not even trying, as, as some other politicians are saying, to reunite the country, the nation, right? And um, I think this is one lesson uh, that countries like Indonesia and India need to learn, you know, that uh, big democracies like our countries uh, need to be mindful um, that playing um, uh, parochial politics um, could uh, well endanger the unity of the federation or unity of uh, the country. Um, and I think, as you can see in the US, uh, which I'm also seeing to a certain extent in Indonesia, is this um, use of uh, religious language in politics that sort of, I think, uh, uh, alludes to what the earlier um, uh, you know, questioner had, had posed, which is this um, uh, you know, uh, politics of exclusion. 
You know, in Indonesia, we also have groups that are vying uh, to set up or to establish an Islamic state and to uh, re-establish the uh, Islamic Caliphate, you know. But these are very um, fringe groups, but yet uh, they are very loud and very influential in social media. So this is where the danger lies, uh, especially when it comes to our young generation who might not have the necessary uh, you know, uh, analytical ability and, and competency to sort of uh, distinguish between uh, you know, political, religious, demagoguery and, and common sense. You know, and I think that's what's happening. I think to a certain extent, uh, you know, some of the more extreme propaganda, uh, you know, that we are seeing in India is also sort of um, heading to that direction as well. So I think there needs to be other forces that uh, could at least uh, mitigate this problem of, you know, um, uh, negative propaganda against especially the religious minorities. So, Dick, uh, and yes, Dr. Anirudh Bhaman, I think you have one question. Uh, Dr. Sofian might know, uh, like in the year 1919 in India, there was a massacre in mm -hmm. a place in Punjab called Jallianwala Bagh. I was just reading today, mm -hmm. once again, uh, when, during the British rule. Now, at that point, point of time, most of the religious groups were close together. They were fighting a common enemy. Now, at the moment, what I find is we are fighting another common enemy. But unless we are really sure that this is a real enemy, we can't fight it together. I think uh, that uh, that problem is there in our mind still uh, because we are taking it very, very casually at times. Uh, that could be a unifying factor, it looks like, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I certainly hope so. And, and certainly um, there is, to a certain extent, uh, a sort of unifying force, uh, you know, uh, that is um, sort of galvanizing um, against the struggle uh, against uh, COVID-19, definitely. But we have also seen some of these uh, fringe groups uh, um, sort of trying to exploit uh, the pandemic and sort of criticizing the government and, uh, you know, the people for adhering to the uh, stay-at-home orders and the lockdowns, quarantines and the social restrictions and what have you. Hence, we also had the problem with the Jama Tabligi, for instance, uh, as you had in India. Uh, and, and the same thing occurred as well in Indonesia and Malaysia, where it also became uh, quite problematic for the government to ultimately, uh, you know, step up its uh, mitigation measures against uh, this group simply because uh, they weren't adhering to the um, physical distancing policy that were uh, enforced by the government. And so um, in, in my mind, there is um, this uh, sense of religious uh, ignorance and religious uh, arrogance as well uh, in, in some quarters within the uh, religious groups. Yeah? Uh, and I've seen this as well in, in the U.S., you know, where the Christian, um, especially the charismatic groups and, and what have you, for instance, saying that, you know, our faith is bigger and stronger than the COVID-19, you know, that I'm soaked in Jesus' blood and therefore I'm, uh, you know, immune to this virus and so on and so forth, you know. You see the same kind of dynamics and lamentations by uh, some of the religious groups here among the Muslim groups, you know, saying that, oh, our wudu, our ablution will protect us from uh, the COVID-19, that Allah is greater than uh, the COVID-19 and blah, blah, blah. And so, um, but to me, uh, this is something in which um, education plays a role, you know, I mean, uh, not education as in uh, schools, but, you know, public campaigns and awareness building about the dangers of uh, this new coronavirus. Uh, I, 
you know, I really counter you in this way. And uh, even in India, when actually it came for the first time, uh, the the current government they took initiative to drink uh, gomutra or cow urine. So that will actually create immunity. Yes, uh, yes, cow urine. Yes, mm -hmm. Kamal, you, you, you heard right thing. Mm -hmm. So you can even uh, search in internet also. So mm -hmm. yes, so that's a pro Hinduism in, in our country also. They took the initiative to drink. And you know, in that instance, actually so many people got very much uh, infected with the drinking of that. So that was a versa visa effect of the, uh, any kind of pro things not hindu not muslim but any kind of extreme thinking process can create this kind of uh, serious issues and as you rightly pointed out that awareness not the not the bookish uh, literature but the awareness and that is a main uh, education system that we need to create and i think that is the point when i thought that we should create this kind of awareness program and how we can create so i thought that let's create a web platform that where you know other countries uh, expert people can come over here and share their thoughts their views actually this oneness we all are equal from baha'i from hindu from muslim from christianity from buddhism so i think the, the platform i really wanted to create that where from multi-dimensional from different aspect people would come around here and can share their thoughts and we as a student i personally believe that still i'm student i i willing to be a student for a lifetime so I can hear you, Dr. Sophia, and I'm really, really, you know, overwhelmed uh, that you presented your wonderful presentation today. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Please, uh, uh, with your concluding remark, would you like to say something? We have 10 minutes left. Sure. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I, co I completely agree with you. And um, I think we are all learning something new here, uh, you know, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. As I mentioned, you know, we are all uh, sort of learning a new form of language and communication and logic about, you know, we now know the difference between a bacteria and virus, for instance, right? We know the difference between uh, pandemics and endemic, right? We know the difference between quarantine, lockdown, and social restrictions, and, and, and so on, you know. Uh, and so it's, it's all a learning process for everyone, you know, because pandemics don't um, occur as much, you know. And, and so I think uh, as much as we have uh, previously experienced uh, uh, the MERS and, and uh, the avian flu and so on, but, you know, not to the scale of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think one of the uh, great features of this pandemic is that it's non-discriminatory, right? So it's affecting everyone and every faith, every nationality, every ethnicity, every race. Although you do see differences in the way people are responding to the pandemic and the way the health professionals and um, hospitals are taking care of the uh, different peoples coming into uh, these hospitals uh, for treatment and so on. Uh, but the virus itself is, uh, you know, non-discriminatory. So I think uh, this serves as a lesson for all of us as uh, human beings, as, as one species, that, you know, we have uh, a common common enemy as, as as you correctly pointed out. Uh, and I think what's most important is for us to understand that um, every life matters, yeah? And that um, whether he be an Indonesian, an Indian, an American, a European, or what have you, an African, a Chinese, you know, every life matters. And uh, what uh, others are experiencing we might be experiencing it uh, ourselves, you know, because with globalization, with travel, and with such high mobility, uh, you know, these kinds of uh, illnesses, diseases, and viruses, and bacteria um, could easily be 
transmitted, uh, right, uh, from one country to the next, from one region to the next. And so um, I think one of the concluding um, uh, thoughts I have is that we need to rethink about this idea about um, human dignity. Again, Swati and I are uh, still sort of uh, dueling with this idea of uh, human dignity and how it relates to our religious traditions and how it applies to our own lives. And I think there's a lot still to be um, explored with respect to how we see human dignity uh, in light of this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I think the more we think about human dignity, the more we are, uh, you know, realizing that we are the same, you know, that we have the same um, features and characteristics as a species, and therefore we have the same kind of challenges, the common uh, challenges, and therefore there is nothing uh, that should stop us from collaboration and nothing should stop us from cooperation. And that, I think, is... Uh, also one of the essence of what social capital uh, is all about. They're yeah? building alliances and building cooperation among members of society uh, everywhere. Thank you very much for your... Thank you so much. Amal rightly pointed out in this time of unity inside religion and between religion is the main demand to create and regain trust. That is very important, that trust. And this one uh, observation from... Amuntaha Manzor, I think, yes, if India calls itself a secular democratic country, why there is so much uh, winding gap between different religion in India, especially Hindu Muslim division. Uh, Muntaha, I really would like to answer this in a very short way. If you would like to know about the Indian history, you need to learn a lot about Indian history before, uh, you know, commenting on that. So it's all about the governmental policies. Actually, I was born in a Hindu family and um, initially when I went to the schools and sitting in front uh, benches and the last bench were occupied by the Muslims or the Christians, we were not friends at that time. But even after passing out from the schools, till now we are the best friend. So that is the bonding. And it's all about bonding and human dignity and the trust that we actually gained in the school life. So it's known about the Hindu Muslim divisions or the religious uh, minority things. It's all about the bonding trust and the connection between human and human point. So the current scenario, what is happening in Indian uh, situation, it's very unfortunate, but it's all about political gain. So, and don't trust social media, don't trust. So I personally request, so first, educate yourself with the social literacy campaigning and uh, go to the appropriate media link. Don't trust social media anyhow, because it creates so many uh, unfortunate things together. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dicky Sofian, for this wonderful session. Much. Maybe, you know, uh, we can have more and more session upcoming days. And uh, in this way, we can actually learn from you and from other experts also. So uh, here I, with my thanking notes, I really uh, welcome all the participants because with this uh, discussions, we came to know so many things together. And I think together we have to grow because in this coronavirus, I think gave us the opportunity to know something from outside, out of the box, because we have something preconception notion in our mind. Let's. Uh, let's discuss and you know i think with these discussions some new terminology some new theory would come around in the upcoming days so uh, here i would like to uh, end up the session and not to say goodbye but see you all again all right bye, bye. see you then